I'm Doug McKenzie and welcome to The Fintech Show. In this episode, we study the changing payments landscape brought about by instant payments. We gathered thought leaders from various institutions and payment specialists from around the world. We kick off the episode with real-time payments guru, Craig Ramsey from ACI Worldwide, who breaks down how and why ACI have been critical to the development and success of payments for the last 40 years. Well, 40 years is a long time in, in any industry and to be at the forefront of payments and IT and financial technology for 40 years is an immensely proud place to be for ACI. We've actually been in real-time payments for 40 years as well. Those very first card transactions that needed to be authorised at the point of sale, that authorisation of an ATM transaction required real-time processes from day one. So we've been around real-time payments for a long, long time and, and we've moved from you know, 40 years ago with a few transactions to now over a billion transactions every day. So we see a lot of change as well around the payments ecosystem. More recently, there's been SEPA in Europe, changes to ACH processes, uh, changes in currency like the euro, for example. But really now, the only conversation that's out there is about open and real-time, real-time cross-border payments as well. And all of those aspects are all part of that real-time ecosystem. So underlying all of those is the need to be able to support the always on mentality that the customer has. The customer requires an experience that they can do payments, they can do banking 24 seven. They don't expect not to be able to do it at two o'clock in the morning anymore. So open banking, well that provides fintechs the ability to service some of those customers with the unique value propositions that they can offer and open up those banks to that value-added services the fintechs can do. For cross-border payments, we see the likes of Swift's GPI and Ripple starting to offer better services around the traditional correspondent banking model, improving the speed of the payments, improving the information flow that's going between the, the different correspondents, and of course, the originator and the beneficiary of the payment. They get a better experience. So all of those things, they all come together under that real-time enablement. But you can't just turn real-time on. You must have the back-end systems, you must have the back-end processes, you must have the bank mentality of that always-on environment. So you need to do things thousands of times every second with very low latency, very low end-to-end -end transaction times to actually process those transactions. We can't be looking at a transaction that takes a minute 30 seconds. We need a transaction that goes through the bank fully secure in less than a second. Over at Metro Bank, Ali Patterson spoke with David Tomasson about how PSD2 was fueling the evolving payments industry. We also spoke with Matt Breers, the CFO at TransferWise, who broke down how they were adapting to the shifting regulation to remain ever integral. It's early days. So invariably this was going to be a huge race to the start line, I think it is, and there's been a huge technology investment from a whole range of banks, both large, small, uh, medium, with a range of technologies in place, legacy systems, brand new systems, etc., to get to the start line. Uh, and then we've got the third party processes, the TPPs on this side, all desperately trying to work out how to uh, gain access a, to the data that's been shared through uh, account information sharing capabilities, but then also what to do with it. How do they productize, turn that information into a value add for their customer base? Um, some seem to be on the front foot with it in terms of TPP. So if you look at the open banking entity and go to their website, openbanking.org.uk, you can see a range of TPPs who are effectively registered. The, um, uh, I guess the, the businesses they're in or the use cases they're looking to work through and just uh, how they're going to leverage the data. So I think there's about 20 organisations on that side. You then take it to the banks. Clearly a number of banks are beginning to partner now and, and, and anticipate what sorts of solutions they can provide to their, uh, their customers. HSBC is the big one that's recently gone out with that account aggregation capability. So as a, a customer, an online banking customer for HSBC, you can now begin to pull in bank account details from all the bank accounts you've got uh, domestically. And that's good, and I think account aggregation, you'll see a lot of banks begin to provide that service. Why? Because it means they're always being drawn back into their systems and their front-end online banking apps as opposed to going to potentially an independent third party that does the same sort of thing. So you see that sort of thing happening. 
I think you'll also see individual banks now partnering more and more with specialist um, TPPs that really provide them with something that the bank themselves, whilst they could build it, it would take them a long time to build that sort of capability. And I'll give it might be difficult to get funding, prioritisation against everything else they've got. So you'll see things like, for example, accounting platforms, funny enough, uh, are now beginning to tie with individual banks. I think RBS made a big acquisition of an accounting software package just the other day. You can see how open banking, they'll work with that software package and arguably offer it to their business customers almost as a default package right now. I think you'll see more and more of this over time. It's early, early days, but individual banks will begin to develop and, and probably roll out their own, I'd say, unique strategies. I think we'll see. I think there's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of, uh, a lot of consultants who've made statements about what the future will look like. I'd be really interested to see if banks have a uh, uh, cron uh, contrarian view on any of that sort of thing, if I'm honest. But it will take time. I'm not sure we live in a PSD2 world yet, which is part of our frustration. <laughs> so PSD set out in two very noble intentions. One is to make customers aware um, how much they were paying for their products and the pricing. And the second was to bring open banking. Um, now, on the first one, we're actually quite disappointed that it's not been mandated yet, that, um, that banks naturally need to tell their customers how much they're charging them for one of the highest priced products that they offer. One of the biggest challenges in money transfer is actually making customers, having customers aware of this problem. Um, there's some $200 billion charged by banks every year for this product and we believe that banks should actually be, told, be, be required to tell their customers they're charging them this. That's not happened yet and we'll continue to work with regulators, whether in Europe, in the UK or much more, much more broadly to just try and continually push to, to do what any customer would expect and tell them how much they're charging for a product. So from a PSD2 world, we're definitely not there. <laughs> um, the second item of, of um, offering open banking, that's definitely moving. But the question is, is how well will that be executed? Um, so we're very excited to, you know, and many companies and, it's, and customers should be excited to be able to, to reduce some friction and be able to you know, make the banking platforms around the world, frankly, more useful and convenient to use for, for anybody. And that will end up with more competition, better products for customers, um, reduced cost, increased speed, more convenience, um, which is exactly our intention. But that's going to be slow. And, uh, and banks have got a lot on their plate and the extent to which they can execute on open banking is uh, it's, it's, not, it's not in my control. How can we offer some of these services and this capability ourselves without being beholden to a bank? So you'll have seen um, uh, a few months ago we announced that actually we're now part of the first payment scheme. So instead of working through banks and needing to have open banking through banks, we've now got a direct connection to the, um, to the first payment scheme with our own uh, real-time gross settlement account. So we can operate much of that functionality ourselves, offering customers you know, very, very cheap payments, um, instant payments and we can build our own platform on top of that so it's very convenient. So, so on PSD2, that second element, it's exciting and it will definitely will reduce friction for our customers. But actually, from transfer wise, you know, we're going in a direction that um, we may not need much of that functionality ourselves in the future anyway. So in this post PSD2 world, how does ACI Worldwide help the institutions and the fintechs mm -hmm. manage this new expectations around instant payments? So with so many systems in so many banks around the world, we're constantly asked, how do we open up these systems that we have in place today? We shouldn't expect to just go in and suddenly replace systems with new API, with JSON and all sorts of other fancy technology required to bring open APIs to market. What we have is technology that can actually open up some of our existing systems, systems that have been stable, in place, running at banks for many years, but they can still offer open banking services. So we have some wraparound services. Our API manager, for example, will provide those wraparound services in order to open up the APIs from these traditional or legacy systems into the modern world of open banking. Um, so PSD2 introduces the, the concept of strong customer authentication. So uh, what does that enable? Let's think of a use case. So as a customer, I'm on Amazon or something like that, uh, and I want to buy, what do I want to buy at the minute? I want to buy a, a lampshade, a moving house. I want to buy a lampshade, believe me, it's very important to me. So I go onto Amazon, order this lampshade I want, uh, and then typically I go to the payment options at the end, and I can use one click because I've stored my credit card details there. I can input a different credit card, Going forward under PSD2, I'll be able to pay with my bank account. 
And so Amazon, if it became a, a payment, in, uh, payment service provider, or a payment initiation service provider, I should say, uh, they could then allow me to effectively provide my online banking credentials, or a form of that, uh, to enable the payment to go from my, directly from a bank without the need for cards and that sort of stuff. How strong customer authentication, that process to provide my credentials, authenticate, uh, will, will roll out, is something we're still yet to see uh, really emerge. On the one hand, you could leverage biometrics, you can put in uh, simple passwords and it could be really, really seamless. Not frictionless, but pretty easy. Uh, but on the other, it might be that the bank is effectively putting a, a stronger degree of authentication than you would with a credit card, therefore making it harder, potentially, uh, to complete the payment. There is some debate even now about uh, the APIs that are being developed for open banking and the way that payment initiation will occur uh, and whether the likes of Amazon have to redirect customers back into an online banking style environment or whether they can push it through seamlessly in their uh, user experience, their UI uh, screen set. That's still not resolved. Um, if they are able to do that, what do you think that leads the world to a, a world of no banks but banking? With the, yeah, you, with the bank of Amazon, if you like. Possibly. I think, really, if, if we think about it, banks have developed a certain way of deploying their mobile banking apps, the online banking. Whilst they all try to be different, they all have different branding and things, essentially you kind of know where things are and, and how to do various functions. I think what the platforms or the Amazons, whoever it might be, the Google, they bring a very different outlook on user experience and the UI and what, what you're used to. So. They could go there. I think it'll be some time before people start getting used to how Amazon would do a payment versus how a bank would make a payment from a bank account. But I think the risk is very, very genuine. The, you know, the buzzword is the disintermediation of the banks, essentially, because you've got that front end, which is provided by a trusted but non-financial institution for making payments. Uh, again, it will take some time. Uh, it will really make, take some time. And you've got to question the trust values. We know that Banks are well trusted, despite all the, um, uh, the the press about how much banks are hated in some instances. There's, there's a, a, a lot that banks still need to do to uh, to win the customer in terms of uh, satisfaction. At the end of the day, there's a lot of trust placed in banks and bank systems to do those things around what is quite important is people's money. Uh, how an Amazon or anyone else in that space begins to take their their trust for. I don't know, shopping and begins to move that into the world of payments and banking. I think the jury's out on that and it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, that moves forward. So a payment needs to happen in milliseconds nowadays. Um, when we talk about a frictionless payment, it means it can't stop in the back office for someone to check that it's okay. It can't go through a process that takes two hours to, to authorise. It needs the core banking always on to be able to ensure that the funds are there. But there's also security. Sometimes a bank's core banking system does need to be maybe taken offline for a bit of time, but the services can't be taken offline, they have to be 24-7. So again, the technology that we're providing into banks, our universal payments technology, is really aimed at true 24-7 operation, no downtime even for upgrades, but to ensure that the payments can happen fast. They have to be fast. We can't take more than a second to process a payment end to end and that includes all of the core banking checks, the fraud checks, any exception handling checks, all of those things need to happen instantly. An open API, a fintech using an open API, simply needs to use that service. Those same services that a bank can offer to its own customers. While PSD2 is helping Europe innovate in payment tech, DBS's Neil Cross talks to Ali Patterson about real-time cross-border payments and how they're still actually an issue. We've had uh, near real-time cross-border payments, so you know I use them personally. I think I'm, I send a lot of money to Indonesia for my social enterprise, and it happens very quickly. Uh, that's from a DBS account to a non-DBS account. Um, uh, that we have the corridors built for that, um, and that works great as well. And back to the UK, um, in Singapore, we have peer-to-peer -peer payments with Paylah, and you know Singapore also has a great payment infrastructure around Fast. And then you look into India and part of the India stat there, you have UPI as well. Um, but the cross-border to cross-border is still very difficult to do that kind of peer-to-peer -peer based on phone number. But that's going to change, you know, in a very short period of time. Um, there is a lot of fintechs who focus in that space. Um, there is, obviously, it seems to be a good place for blockchain technology and finance. 
Um, so what I would say is, is watch this space as we, we expand out and expand the corridors that we operate in. And what about on the, the larger scale, so not so much on the consumer side, but the big corporates doing big transfers of many, many different currencies? What are some of the cool stuff that you guys are doing there? Uh, so we did a uh, innovation called Prism, and what that does, it helps corporate treasurers manage their cash, um, because corporates, it isn't about a payment. It's actually, they've got a business which is spread across Asia, money's coming in and out, they've got many different currencies, regulations, bills to pay, and actually they just want to manage their business across Asia. So Prism um, uh, won, won a global award out of Europe on, on day two. And so what we're trying to do is really focus on the journey. Payments is part of the journey for sure, but actually our customers are doing something bigger and more important to them than payments, so that's the problems we're trying to solve. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us for the next episode of The Fintech Show.